Well, I'm Thijs. Um, I work at a company called AppSignal, and we have sort of have an, we're fully remote. We have an internal conference that we do every year because you kind of have to invent these ways of, of like staying in touch with each other and kind of understanding uh, uh, who everybody is. So I've been doing. So this presentation has been like four years in the making. Like I, I did a bunch of uh, of internal of of uh, of, uh, of talks about music stuff, and I kind of wrapped it all up into one big thing here. So this is like some examples of, of like stuff that people do at a company. Turns out meerkats are assholes, I did not know. Uh, people are into pipes. Uh, procrastination is a big thing amongst developers, I've heard. <laughs> yeah, so what I usually do is I get into, uh, I've been getting into music production myself for a couple of years. And uh, I, I sort of figured out that writing code is a really good way of understanding the world because it kind of forces you to actually uh, uh, grok the whole mental model or otherwise you're not going to be able to automate something. So for this presentation I went through this process which I've done before which is basically not understanding anything about it, like forcing yourself to understand it through uh, modeling it in code and uh, now I'm here like uh, sharing the results of that with you. So what we're covering today is like we'll do a really quick history of music uh, recording technologies, so just so we kind of know where we ended up. And then we're getting into uh, digital audio and like some ways to manipulate it and generate sound with it. So, um, yeah, so what is music actually? I think that's, that's, that's sort of the starting point. Uh, music is a really weird thing because it, it, it only exists in our brain. Like we don't, like all the neuroscientists don't really understand how this whole process works. So somehow there are these waves uh, of sound, which uh, you can kind of visualize like this. They're, they're, they're um, kind of similar to like how a wave would operate in water, which, which is a little more intuitive for us. So what you're seeing here actually also happens at the moment in this room where these, where these speakers kind of like cre just create, uh, a create movement in the air and it kind of like oscillates its way into, into your ear. Uh, once it makes it to your ear, there's a bunch of these really tiny hairs that are called follicles and they vibrate as well and that gets picked up by your brain. And when it's in your brain, like we have no clue. Somehow we kind of like find meaning in, in all these waveforms and, we, and we, we just perceive it as music and it's an emotional thing. And, we have no clue why, uh, maybe we'll find out someday. So how does this sort of like basic process work? So we've got a, uh, uh, one important aspect, aspect of this is pitch. So this is the number of times that this waveform kind of oscillates. Um, so this is like a very simple waveform, I'm just going to uh, let you hear it. So this is just a, uh, um, a sine wave, which is kind of, um, which is uh, uh, oscillating 440 times a second, and then you end up with this sound. Um, if you uh, play it like at multiple frequencies, you you kind of perceive it as be as having notes. That sounds a little bit like this. Oh. Sorry, messed up the order there. That's purely a sine wave that we generated uh, that's uh, uh, just playing at these different fre frequencies. Uh, next up is Stambra. So this is what you get when you go from, uh, from having like a really simple wave to like a more complicated wave with all, the, all these kind of like little edges you see there. So then you get like something like a piano note. It's, uh, it, it just, uh, it does a completely different sound to it, but it's the same pitch. Uh, next up is tempo. So, tempo is, is like what you get when you uh, when you play when you play the drone, for example. So, this is like two wa waveforms that with just some space in between, and uh, like we immediately perceive that as having a tempo. Um, well, and if you combine all that stuff, you already get something that's kind of like music. So you get like uh, 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 a little a little few notes. And then if you add rhythm to that, it uh, kind of starts feeling like music. And then if you do like a little bass line, it's sort of a song. It's probably the most boring song that has ever been created. 
but it is a song. Like I think we all agree that it's it's that it's music. Yeah. So back in the day, like there were no like there was no recorded music. So people, you could just like go into a room and see some somebody play, and that was it. And uh, this kind of changed. Uh, uh, like at the beginning of the 20th century. So we'll just like really quickly gloss over uh, this so, uh, so we have a bit of a basis. So this is the first uh, uh, known music recording device in history. So there's a little roll on there and there's a wax layer. And then if you kind of like shout really hard into that hole, like there's this little needle kind of vibrates and it, it makes a pattern into, into, in the wax. And if you kind of like replay that, you get like a really silent uh, uh, signal back. So this wasn't really useful, but it was the first one. That kind of evolved into these like record players. It was still completely mechanic, so they didn't produce a lot of volume. So people would record like this. So like the, this little cone you see over there really had to be like right in the middle of the of the action, otherwise there would basically be, be no signal. Uh, then these tape machines happened, so that kind of encoded the waveforms just in like magnetic charge. Like there were these little iron particles uh, on the tape, and they they kind of like charged in one direction or the other, and that kind of like there was a way to like also record these waveforms and kind of like play them back. But then, like World War II happened, and then like the whole, the whole thing really started uh, uh, moving fast because a lot of technology was invented for radar and so on that later turned out to be uh, really useful in recording as well. So we got tubes. So with these tubes, you could amplify a signal. So you could take something that's really silent, uh, like the microphone coming out of the, the signal coming out of this microphone, for example, is like it's a tiny amount of electricity, and in the end. You need a lot of electricity to kind of power that speaker that's producing the, uh, uh, the uh, that's getting the air to move. Yeah, so we got these tubes. You know, things started becoming more ambitious. Like we got like a lot of microphones. Th these types of microphones also had like little tubes in them to amplify the signal. You know, we got these mixing desks, uh, record players. Like a lot of transistor-based stuff was then done. So this is a this is an old compressor that doesn't use tubes anymore. And then the 80s happened, and the whole thing changed. <laughs> or got, like, uh, a lot of people think, like, this is kind of when it got terrible, because, like, then we got digital audio, and, uh, 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 like, we got a CD. And digital audio is, is uh, sort of perfect. Like, it took a long, long way for people to find a way to make digital audio actually sound good. And uh, that's what we're, getting, what we're getting to now. So what's digital audio? It's uh, a way to sample these waveforms uh, and reproduce them that way. So instead of like in the natural world, you'd, you'd get a, a really smooth, like actually smooth curve. It's, uh, uh, it's an almost perfect smooth curve. And what we do when, when we um, create digital audio, you sample that. So you, you just take these measurements uh, uh, thousands of times per second, and you can use that to sort of like recreate the waveform that you measured uh, in a way that 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 uh, just that it just almost exactly sounds the same. Yeah, and then uh, the all that old recording technology got kind of replaced by software like this. So this is a program I like to use, uh, and it kind of contains all these like all the gear that used to be in a million dollar studio. It's now kind of like embedded in this this type of software. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is recreate like a few parts of this uh, software using Ruby code, and, uh, and we'll get to see uh, how this stuff actually works. So digital audio. So it's a lot of numbers. So we're going to use uh, a gem called the Wave File Gem uh, in this presentation, and uh, uh, that's able. That gem is able to read and write uh, uh, digital audio. So this is like a little bit of code. So we just open a file. We just uh, smash all the numbers into one big thing, and then we can work with it. And then you, then you get this. So yeah, that's not really useful. Well, that's not really useful for human. We can also write stuff back. Another gem we're using is uh, Chunky PNG. So that, that lets us create some images, because we need to like, be able to see what we're doing. So what, we, what we're going to do is like go from this uh, to an image like this. So this, these images, uh, the next one, 
uh, this is like the beginning of a, of a hi-hat sound. So it looks kind of random. If you take a sine wave that we talked about earlier, like it, it it, it's a bit easier to crack what happens. So the white line in the middle is, is kind of like the zero point. And then we've got a we've got a wave that's kind of like oscillating from, from positive to negative, and it kind of like flows around this uh, this line in the middle. And this is some code to generate these images. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking this really long array of numbers, these samples, uh, and we're just drawing a point like either above or below the line. Uh, we're doing some calculations to kind of like figure out where they uh, where they are supposed to end up. It doesn't really matter uh, what the calculations are. I, I will share this code after the presentation if you want to play around uh, with it. Um, and like another uh, visualization that's very often used is uh, this kind of is this visualization where you're kind of compressing these uh, these shapes into each other. So this one is still. Like we see individual dots for every single sample here. So this is probably only like 0 0.01 seconds of, of audio that you're looking at here. And here we're looking at like a full five seconds of audio. So we're kind of like compressing it. So that's, that's going to be the two visualizations uh, I'm going to use for the rest of the presentation. Um, just do all the, you can look at this if you want later. So the first thing we're going to emulate in Ruby is amplification. So this is the process of uh, making sound, sound louder. And like, this is like what the tubes used to do. So we're taking uh, uh, this piece of audio, which is the same drum loop we did earlier. And we're going to make it a little bit louder. And um, then even a little louder than that. That's, uh, uh, we're going to get, get to this in a minute. So this is like, we made it a little bit louder, and then we made it louder again. And then like things, things went horribly wrong. Um, so what, what are we doing here? So we're uh, uh, basically just, it's, uh, in the end it's relatively simple. We're just looping through all the samples. And we're just like uh, 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 multiplying them. So that's, that's the whole thing. There's nothing else to it. So um, uh, we get, we just like, well, whichever sample had like a value of 100 gets a value of 200. If you do that consistently over the duration of the whole sample set, like it's going to sound the same, only louder. And if we do it like with a ratio of four, so we make it four times as loud, you get this, this thing which is the bane of every, every sound engineer out there. It's clipping, it's what we just heard. So, <laughs> so this is what happens. What you see here is that these, like, these peaks in the signal are kind of like going uh, higher than we have space for in the image. And that means they're kind of being cut off. So you get this, this, this distortion effect that uh, sounds pretty bad uh, if you do it in a digital way. But it's also a really crucial element of a lot of music. So like if any time you hear like Jimi Hendrix play the guitar, they, they basically use this, this, this effect of just cranking too much signal into something that can't really handle that. And then it starts kind of like uh, mutating the signal. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's sort of like the simplest thing we can do. It's just amplifying the sound. We can also make sound. So uh, uh, in the analog world, you've got, uh, well, there's lots of ways to make sound. But like one way is, is using a synthesizer. So a synthesizer has these sound sources and filters and all kinds of stuff. But we're going to focus on the sound sources. Uh, so there's a couple of things you can do to make sound. So one of them is, is uh, having noise. Uh, this is what, we're, we're, what you're seeing on the screen is basically random pixels, and if you if you translate that to a sound, you can just get white noise noise that you might be familiar with. Like if you put an old TV to uh, to like a, a non-existent signal, then you will get stuff like this. And generating uh, a noise in Ruby is also like relatively simple code. So we're just going to loop through, uh, we're going to have a loop. And we're just going to like insert a random number in the range of like this lowest negative value and this high, highest positive value. You slam it in, into the array and, well, you, you've got noise. Um, 
So it turns out that like a lot of this audio stuff is like if you if you translate it into Ruby code, it's it's you end up like with like five lines, which is kind of interesting, I think. Another thing you can make is a square wave. Yeah, that sounds like this. So this is uh, uh, also a crew. This you hear this in music a lot. Actually, it sounds horrible now because we made a really simple one. But if you kind of like process it, to you it's it's a big part of electronic music. And making a square wave uh, looks a little bit like this. So. Um, Again, we're looping, uh, uh, I created a, 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 an oscillator here, which is kind of like a thing that kind of alternates between, uh, between two sides, kind of like a metronome. And we're uh, looping through samples again. And, and we're, depending on like where we are in the oscillation, we either pick like a high value or a low value. And then you end up with a graph like this, where these, these like high and lows are kind of stacked. Uh, on the others, on the uh, opposite ends of the middle, and uh, uh, you get a square wave. Uh, yeah, this is the code to uh, uh, to generate uh, uh, the call set oscillator. Another uh, often used wave is a sine wave. That sounds like this. And a sine wave has a slightly more complex math behind it. So uh, we're using math.sin to kind of to, uh, uh, calculate the, the next point based on the angle uh, uh, that, that the signal is moving in. Um, I, again, this, this is probably, if you're interested in this, uh, like definitely look at the examples. Um, we, uh, this is uh, Mr. Fourier, and he, uh, he's a French uh, mathematician, and he, f he found out that all uh, sound can actually be represented by different sine waves uh, uh, that, that can be merged. So you could have something like this, which is uh, a combination of, of two sine waves. And you get a chord, so if, if you combine these two, it's a little bit off, actually, but it's, it's a chord. Uh, and the code for that is, 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 is uh, also like not a whole lot of code. So we're cr uh, creating like different, uh, three different sine uh, wave generators. And we kind of merge those, those uh, together. So this brings us to the uh, next part of the, of the uh, presentation. I'm just going to skip this, which is mixing. So this is, uh, this is a mixing desk. Uh, so, like sound comes in into all these like paths that you see here that all have a different fader, and then it, it's merged into one signal that comes out at the end of the thing. Uh, so what you do is you have like multiple waveforms, multiple channels, and you kind of combine them into this more complex thing. So these are three waveforms that we uh, were listening to earlier. Uh, we can read them uh, into into three separate arrays. And then we loop through, through the, uh, the whole thing, and we just like, take all the numbers uh, that, uh, uh, that we got from all three of these tracks, just sum them together, and, uh, and we get the signal back. So one thing we have to do to here is like, uh, divide things by 1.5 to, to avoid this clipping issue, because if you keep stack, stacking up those numbers, you're, like, you're going to go above the limit of the thing, and you kind of like, have to bring the level down to get back to the uh, proper level again. Then we get this uh, result. This thing has actually been mixed by the Ruby code that we were looking at earlier. Um, and the last uh, technique I want to talk to, to you about today is compression. So compression is, uh, and I'm not talking about MP3. So this is uh, audio compression. There, there used to be machines like this one uh, that did it. Well, this one is still actually really popular. This, this is an extremely expensive device that's used on a lot of records. So what compression does is it takes a, it takes a waveform it takes a waveform that ha that has these these peaks. So if you play the drum, you're going to get a uh, you're going to get a, a, a sort of like really high value at the beginning, and then kind of as the sound kind of tapers off, it becomes it becomes less loud. But that's often not what you want if you're making music because you you want to have like a consistent level uh, that's pleasant to listen to. 
So what compression does is uh, you, you kind of draw a line, which is called the threshold. Uh, and you want the, the, the peaks that are above this line to kind of like become less loud. So what you do is you, you make them less loud. And then, um, uh, and then you can make the whole thing like a little bit louder. So you get a, a so you, uh, uh, you get like a consistently higher level for the whole signal. So we'll take a, a, a little sample I have here. Just like a little simple hit. And we're going to apply this compression to it in two steps. So again, we're looping through all the samples. And whenever we see that, that this, this, this value is above the, the threshold that we set, we just uh, uh, divide it by the ratio. And if we see that it's lower than the, than the signal that we just set, then we just add it. So we're only going to like, manipulate these like, larger parts of the signal, so to balance it all out. And, in the end, and then in the second step, we're going to apply some gain to it. So we're just, to, just uh, uh, multiplying it by a number uh, and, uh, and adding it back to this, into this array. And that looks like this in the end. So, so it's just a two-step process, and then we're writing it back to disk. And then you go from this form to this form. So you see like it, it, it like elevated the parts of the sound that were, that were less loud. And it sounds horrible because this is a terrible compressor, but it's, uh, you can sort of hear what happens. So this is the, uh, the original one. Yeah, it's, it sounds really unnatural if you do it like this. But it's, uh, I think, a good illustration. Yeah, and that's, that brings me to the end of like, all the things I want to discuss today. So it's almost lunchtime. Um, but I have one, one more thing. So I think this was all relatively abstract. So I wanted to prove to you all that you can actually make music just using those samples that I used. So I made a cover of, I think, the best song that was ever made in history. And I'm going to play it to you now. Thank you.